Welcome to my fourth video in my series for the action RPG that we're making in Unity. Um, and in this video, we're going to code the player, the player movement. Uh, the previous video, we set up um, all the animations and built the animator. Um, but now we're going to actually get a chance to put that to the test. Um, and so we'll see if we've hopefully followed all the steps correctly. We'll hopefully see if the player works. If, and if not, um, we'll take a look to see what could be wrong. So we're pretty much ready at this point to begin scripting the player. Um, well, I guess I need to add some physics to the player. So right now, um, the player doesn't have any sort of uh, rigid body or colliders, and we're going to need those uh, if we're going to move the player. So let's have the player selected. Go to Components, Physics 2D, not regular physics. This is for the 3D engine. To be fair, you can use a lot of it in the 2D. Uh, however, the 2D stuff is optimized to function in a 2D space. Uh, and I think there is some 2D colliders aren't going to necessarily register collisions with 3D colliders, I think. Um, but anyway, so with Physics 2D, we want to add a circle collider seems the most appropriate for the player. Um, we can see this green outline of, of the circle collider. So I do want to shrink it down a bit. Let's drop it to like 0.3. And then I'm going to change the offset to be negative 0.35. So um, maybe it needs to be slightly more, maybe like 0.36, so that it's touching the bottom of the, the player's feet. Yeah, that looks better. Um, and so that's going to be my uh, hitbox insofar as like being able to walk around in the terrain. And that makes sense. Your head probably shouldn't be colliding with the water. Your feet are what should be colliding with the water. Um, I mean, we could make this smaller, or we could even switch this to a capsule collider if you feel like that would be more appropriate. Um, in general, I think the circle collider is going to be better for not getting stuck on things. So if anything, we could try to make the circle collider slightly smaller, but I would be hesitant to do so. Uh, so next up is a physics 2D rigid body. The rigid body is going to be uh, where we're actually handling our movement because we're going to let a lot of the physics engine handle our movement. Um, and there is some consideration that you might, if you were going to code something from the ground up, maybe not use the physics engine and code your own set of physics um, to optimize performance or to get it to do exactly what you want. Because we will have to jump through a few hoops to make the physics engine to behave the way we want to. So we can't just shove enemies out of the way, for example, um, which we will see once we start adding enemies. Anyway, we don't need to change any of these settings except for probably gravity scale. Uh, gravity scale is set to 1, which means it's going to pull me downwards as if we're playing a side scroller. Um, but we don't have gravity in these isometric RPGs, so set that to 0. And then also under constraints, open that up and choose freeze rotation Z. That'll prevent the character from spinning around when they collide into things. You can always disable it if you want to see some kind of shenanigans once we start moving. So saving my project, and let's build a new folder called scripts. So right click on assets, create folder scripts, create another subfolder called player. I have a lot of scripts. Oops, not players with an S, player. Uh, and then once we've created this player folder in the scripts folder, right click on player, go to create C sharp script, and I'm just gonna call this player. It's going to govern a lot of aspects of the player, uh, so let's give it that, that name. Uh, and while I'm here, I am going to attach it to my player object. So I'm going to drag and drop it onto the player, verifying that it has moved over there. So double click it, and Visual Studio will start open. All right, here's our player script. So right now we're focused on movement. So let's start adding some variables that we're going to need for movement. I think we're going to definitely need a move speed. Um, and then we need some variables to kind of capture the components that we need. So we're going to need a private rigid body 2D uh, called body. 
um, a private vector 2. Since we're operating in a two-dimensional space, we don't use vector 3s. Although, there are a lot of times where we will get a vector 3, um, but any time that we do, you can actually cast a vector 3 to become a vector 2, and all it does is creates a it either ignores the z component or adds a zero for the z component if you're switching between vector twos and vector threes. Let's access the animator. Privates, animator, lowercase a animator, and privates, capital S sprite renderer, lowercase s sprite renderer. Some lazy variable names here. Last thing I'm going to add under the movement section here is um, private float move modifier. So this game I do want to have a little bit more interesting movement mechanics. And so move modifier is going to allow us to potentially add debuff effects, um, add like slowing mud, um, or have the player slow down if they're attacking so that you can't like attack and move at full speed. So move modifier is going to add some interesting things to it. So those are our core variables for movement. Under start, we've got to kind of do the usual suspects, basically binding the components to their variables. So that means body is going to equal get components rigid body 2D. Um, animator is going to equal get components animator. Um, sprite renderer is going to equal the get components sprite renderer, capital S sprite renderer. Alright, and so that's attached all of our um, components that we need and I don't think I need to change much else in here so we're probably fine. Moving on to the update function. Put some comments here. It's going to get kind of large. So in the update function, uh, we need to begin polling um, the movement axes, axes for the player movement. So let's go with get inputs movement dots x so this is that um, vector 2 that I created a, there is going to be set equal to input dot get access raw um, we could get access raw basically gets you the thing without any sort of smoothing uh, we're using keyboard for movement so it might not even be noticeable and we're going to get the horizontal axis if you misspell that, we will get a crash. Movement.y equals input.getAxisRaw. Vertical. You can try it with just get axis. I really don't think you're going to notice much of a play difference. All right, so we've got our movements. Now let's send those to the um, animator. So. We're going to send those to the animator. So animator.setFloats, that's going to tell it those variables that we created. And so we have to spell it correctly. This, this is the name of the variable from um, the animator panel. So I'm going to just finish typing this out. Then we're going to do it for the vertical. Those are going to match to um, the variables from here. It's got to recompile the scripts. This is this is what it is referring to. So whenever I've got, um, I'm accessing the animator and saying set the float. So this string horizontal is going to attempt to match to this if there's a spelling mistake on either end or even a capitalization mistake, it's not going to find it. Um, but this is how you can access these variables inside the animator. Uh, you can get them too, um, but this is the easiest way to communicate. 
So that should send that information. We're going to gather the speed now. So this should get the overall direction that I'm pressing. It's not the it's not the true magnitude yet because um, I'm not applying my move speed to it. And, and so this might need to change if we're going to think about like running and stuff. So, but for now, let's just we'll just do this. Um, and there is some performance discussion to be made for using movement dot um, the square magnitude which is before they take the square root, which is slightly quicker, but right, animator dot set float. We're going to set that speed variable that we see um, right here. And we're going to set that to speed. All right, um, so we've got all that, and let's hit save. We now need to actually begin the move. So um, that is a fixed update task because we are interacting with physics. So let's start adding fixed update. And so inside of fixed update, uh, we want to, if we actually are pressing these keys, so if movement.x is not equal to zero or movement.y is not equal to zero. So basically, are we pressing a key to do something? Um, now, I guess I'm not gonna fully run this command yet, but we movement dot normalize. Um, that would normalize the movement vector. The reason that that's an issue is because of this kind of effect in a game. So let's say we have a player and the player is right there and we push the up key. Well, you know, normally this is just going to be 1.0 and it's going to be multiplied by our move speed, whatever. Let's just assume our move speed is 1. So you're, you're traveling at a speed of 1. But if the player is pushing both um, right and up, the resulting vector is, that's like the longest looking up arrow I've drawn. So at least kind of get these similar. Both of these are 1.0 vectors. You might see where this is going. Um, but the actual motion the player is going to be making is that, and that's actually the square root of 2, which is approximately 1.4. And so in a top-down game like this, if we let the player push up and right simultaneously, they're actually moving 40% faster than we would intend them by moving diagonally. So to call movement.normalize, what that's going to do is take this, um, this vector that we have here, this uh, 1.4, and it's actually going to kind of um, scale it down. So what normalize is going to do is turn it into a 1.0 vector so that it's the same length. It's a unit vector at that point. It's the same length as if you were only pushing up. So kind of componentization wise, um, you know, it turns the, um, the x and y components of this vector into what, like sine of 45. I mean, you can go do the trick on that. Uh, so it kind of makes what square root of two over two. So it's not, you're not moving a full one in either direction because you're going diagonal, but you're still moving a max speed of one. Um, kind of an interesting error, an interesting problem. There is some issues with me doing normalize here because let's say you want your player to be sneaking and the player chooses to only move up like 0.5 in the up direction. Well, normalize isn't gonna care 
and normalize is going to go make it like a vector length of one. So it's just kind of an issue there. We could be a little bit more expensive with our with our CPU time and do something like um, movement dots magnitude. If that's greater than one, then we'll call normalize so that uh, it's only going to trigger if we are pressing in a direction that allows us to go faster than intended since it's going to get the magnitude of that vector and if we're pushing up and right at the same time that should produce a magnitude of 1.4 which would trigger the normalize and then I'm going to make a, a, a method out of move so I'm just going to call this move method passing it movement times move speed times move modifier capital N move. I'm doing this because then once we make this move method we can just copy and paste it for the enemy later. Probably should be a private method. Private void move. Oh. Autocomplete is sometimes annoying but I love autocomplete so much that I can deal with those one moments of annoyances. So we're going to take a vector 2 called move. And so we're going to write this move method that's going to handle um, our player's movements. So we'll just kind of keep it mostly clean for now. Uh, one of the things that we are going to have to do in the future is once we start having enemies and stuff, we're going to have to add some code to prevent the player from just shoving the enemies out of the way. But for now, um, let's not too focus too much on that. So there's a couple different approaches we can do to moving. And this is one that's pretty straightforward. If we just do body.move position, that's just going to kind of do a physics based movement. It's going to figure out the destination I'm trying to go to and just snap me to it. Yeah, this one does require time about delta time to work right. So I take a body.position plus move times time dot delta time. So Let's see how that works. Hit save. And we should be able to jump right back into here. Go into our scene. Player has the script attached. Move speed is 5. Everything looks good. Hit play. And we can see that the animator is already kicking in. I've got motion on the player. Um, I've got some weird oddities to these which we're going to have to address soon. I'm going to catch that in this video. All right, so player moves. Pretty good. This is a pretty clean way to handle movement. Um, I don't have the camera following the player yet, so I can't really verify everything else. Um, but you'll see that the player is always like snapping back to looking down. So we might, what I, I, I kind of feel like doing is uh, having him follow the, the mouse so he looks in the direction the mouse is looking since we'll be able to make a ranged attack where the mouse is facing so that kind of makes sense the player should look at it. So that's one type of movement and it's it has its advantages. Uh, but the type I want to do is basically directly modifying the velocity. I'm going to create an, I'm just going to directly set the velocity to be um, a small fraction of my movement vector. Now keep in mind it's adding this every frame. I'm doing a, an addition. Um, and so it's going to add this to the vector. Well actually you know what, let's do the, so let's copy it. Just make this equal. Let's, let's take a look at this one. This one's a little bit simpler. So I'm going to set it equal to the move vector. Uh, and so we hit save. Now this one is going to give us the advantage of allowing us to use um, kind of inertia. So we would have, be able to add ice and other cool things. So let's take a look at that type of movement. A lot slidier. 
Uh, the problem here is my player doesn't have a drag. So we want to go to the player and then take a look at its rigid body. Give a mass maybe like five or something. Linear drag 10 feels pretty good for this. So with the drag, linear drag of 10 and a mass of five, it kind of gives you a nice little like stopping slide. And so you don't immediately stop. Maybe you can increase the drag if that's still not something you like. Um, and the last type I want to try. Uh, this one is, is kind of simple. But I think we get an overall better feel. If we do body.velocity plus equals new vector2 move.x times, um, you can kind of play with that number, I'm doing point 0.2, move.y times point 0.2. Then we have to make sure the player doesn't go too fast. So if body.velocity dot magnitude, so we're take the magnitude of the vector, if that magnitude is greater than the move speed, then we're just going to set the body.velocity to a normalized form of that vector. So body dot um, velocity dot normalized times move speed. And so that will keep us from ex like accelerating too quick because we're adding to my, my motion. We're, we're adding it in the addition is stronger than the drag. So we'll pick up speed and we'll hit our move speed cap very quickly. Actually, I think we'll hit it in approximately like four frames. Uh, ish, somewhere around there. Four to five frames, maybe six with, with drag considered. And so now if I tap the key, I go a little bit less. Um, and it kind of gives you like a little bit smoother of turning. When you're going in a circle, it feels a little bit more natural. Next up, let's get the player to follow the mouse, because that seems like something that is relatively important. Um, that's going to be handled up here under Update. And that's kind of going to be pretty straightforward. Um, we want to face the mouse. So first off, we have to get the mouse's position. So a little bit of shenanigans have to go on here. Um, vector2, um, let's call this mouse world position equals camera dot main dot screen to world point. So it's translating where the cursor is to the equivalent place in an XY format. So that gets that value. Um, Let's create a vector two, call it two mouse. This calculates the relative um, distance to the, from the player to the mouse, so body, body dot position. And so the player will now face the mouse. Well, let's have the code here. If speed is less than um, 0.01, Here. Um, if, if it's less than, we're going to do animator. Oh, actually, we just copy this. Animator dot set float horizontal and set float vertical. But instead of setting them to the movement, I'm going to set them to the two mouse dot x and two mouse dot y. And so now it's going to use those to determine what to look at. So if we're not moving, he, the, the player is going to face the mouse. If we are moving, the player is going to use this movement to determine that. So we can hit save. Um, and now the player should be facing the mouse.
So me it loads. So now, like, to, when I'm moving, if the, the player doesn't care where the mouse is, because the player's going to walk in the direction the player's moving. But if I stop, the player's going to go face the mouse. So that way I can kind of control which way I'm looking, uh, but whenever I'm walking, the walking takes precedence over uh, which way to be looking. Um, so I think um, at this point we're kind of 25 minute mark. Um, I think we'll explore adjusting the, um, the overlap when we actually get the camera to start following the player. So we'll do that task in the next video. Uh, get the camera to actually see the world. Um, right now we can move, we can kind of test some of these colliders. Um, the player is not going to correctly appear on top of things yet. Um, but we will do that in the next video when we get the camera to follow the player. Then the video after that we will um, do some screen transitions. So well, thank you for watching and join me for the next video.